So uh, uh, listen, uh, those of you who were at that uh, event last night in the part of the pre-training for uh, Lens X, we had a lot of residents there. Um, Nick and I uh, just, it was hard to bite our tongues, but, but do know that there was a certain salesmanship going on there in regards to the technology and the rest. I mean, we, we've got it. They don't need to sell us on it. We're, we're going to use it. But uh, uh, to make claims of uh, refractive superiority or that the, uh, or the uh, perfect capsule definitely results in a different refractive outcomes is controversial at the very least. Uh, one study has shown that. There have been multiple studies. In fact, essentially every other study has not been able to show that. So I just wanted the residents to know that it's very hard for me not to speak up when I'm, I'm hearing a sales pitch that's not supported by the literature, but rather than raise a meeting that uh, it is already going too long, going longer, I just wanted to announce that. Nick, anything you want to add to that as well? I mean, we hope with this technology to find out some of those facts I and the rest. I think we're, we're excited that we actually have the technology here to do some studies to see if we can substantiate some of these uh, claims that have been put forth. And we're looking forward to that. Is this? Take, yeah. Dr. Olson. So welcome to Grand Rounds. Today we, we're lucky we're hearing from the Ophthalmic Pathology and Research Fellows. S starting off, we have uh, Greg Kramer from New York. He's talking to us about prevention of uh, PCO. So thanks, Greg. Thanks, Brian. I'm Greg Kramer. I'm one of the Ocular Pathology and Research Fellows this year in the Mammalus Werner Lab uh, at the Moran. And this morning, I'm going to be presenting on IOLs and endocapsular devices that prevent postoperative capsular opacification through maintaining the capsular bag in an open or expanded conformation. And I'll discuss more about what that, those terms mean in a little while. So I'm going to start by giving a brief overview of the relevant lens pathology. So incision of the anterior capsule, whether this occurs during the capsular rexus during cataract surgery or in the event of a trauma, incites a wound healing response in the lens epithelium. And you could divide the lens epithelial cells into two groups based on their location and their functional behavior. The E cells are equa equatorial cells located at the <coughs> lens equator. When they're disturbed, they tend to migrate posteriorly and give rise to somarin's ring proliferation and the pearl form of PCO. In contrast, the anterior cells, or A cells, when they're disturbed, they tend to remain stationary, undergoing pseudofibrous metaplasia and giving rise to fibrosis. In addition, the natural aqueous humor is full of cytokines and growth factors that also have an effect on lens epithelial cell proliferation. TGF-beta is an example of an inhibitory factor, whereas interleukin-1 enhances LEC proliferation. Ultimately, however, Devices and IOLs that enhance the circulation of aqueous humor throughout the capsular bag lead to a decrease in LEC proliferation. And Nishian postulated in a letter to the editor at JSCRS that by increasing the flow of aqueous humor throughout the bag, you dilute the stimulatory factors and prevent them from reaching threshold levels required to have a stimulatory response. Now, while PCO has traditionally been the subject that's been given the most attention, the development uh, and advent of specialized IOLs, in particular dual optic accommodative lenses, which require, rely on relative movement of the anterior capsule relative to anterior optic, sorry, relative to the posterior optic, these devices have spurred an increased interest in ACO. And this is because ACO is a fibrotic entity, and being fibrotic, it can interfere with this kind of movement and the proper functioning of these devices. And in this study by Dr. Werner and colleagues, she uh, looked into many different PCIOL configurations and found that plate haptic silicone IOLs were associated with the greatest amount of ACO. And here you could see at your left, a plate haptic silicone IOL. And in areas where the optic, the anterior surface of the optic contacts the posterior surface of the anterior capsule, it's practically completely opacified, whereas surrounding areas are relatively transparent. 
So the pathogenic mechanism in IOL-related ACO formation is this contact between the capsule and the optic. And this is confirmed histopathologically at right with that ribbon of fibrotic material. Now PCO, there are six traditional mechanisms postulated in its prevention, three related to the surgery and three related to the IOL itself. And for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the IOL-related factors. So first, biocompatibility. You want a lens that minimizes the inflammatory response when introduced into the eye. The second one is really important because this, this is what people traditionally associate with IOL-related PCO prevention. And this is the shrink wrap effect, the idea of having co tight contact between the optic and the posterior capsule. And in Apple et al.'s 1991 review paper on PCO, this is often referred to as the no space, no cells effect. And finally, having sharp edges, uh, a square or rectangular optic edge is also important in PCO prevention. However, through a review of the literature and including several devices studied in this lab at the Moran, doctors Mamelis and Werner noticed a pattern. They noticed that devices that expanded the capsular bag or maintained the anterior capsule far away from the posterior capsule and opened the bag were associated with capsular transparency. And there were 10 such devices that this has been observed in and has manifested in both PCO and ACO prevention. So why does this occur? And there are many pe mechanisms that have been postulated. And before I start, I want to say that it's likely the complex interactions of combinations of these mechanisms uh, with each of the devices. And also that not every device has every mechanism and is associated with different combinations of these mechanisms. So in PCO prevention, the maintenance of the circular postoperative contour is important. Expansion of the bag or separating the anterior and posterior capsules. Exerting pressure on the lens epithelial cells at the sidewalls or mechanical compression inhibition of the capsular bag. And like we said previously, due to the growth factors, enhancing the flow and circulation of aqueous humor. And as was mentioned in association with Dr. Werner's paper, uh, ACO prevention is mainly accomplished by preventing contact between the anterior optic surface and the posterior surface of the anterior capsule. So I'm going on to the devices. And I'm going to start with the capsular tension ring type devices. And I say CTR type devices because the equator ring, the capsular bending ring, and the capsular adhesion preventing ring all have some critical differences from traditional CTRs. Traditional CTRs were designed to maintain the postoperative contour of the capsular bag, and they do that successfully. However, these devices, in addition, are much thicker, and this thickness serves to expand the bag, maintaining the anterior and posterior capsules maximally separated. In addition, all three devices incorporate sharp, square, or rectangular shaped edges, and this edge shifts the capsular bend from the equator to, from the optic, I'm sorry, to the capsular equator. And by shifting the bend to the equator, you create this sharp angle and prevent the centralized migration of lens epithelial cells via contact inhibition. And finally, the capsular adhesion preventing ring incorporates these holes into the apparatus that enhance the circulation of aqueous humor. And in this diagram, it does a good job of showing that here you have the, the ring, um, and the square edges prevent via contact inhibition the migration of lens epithelial cells. In addition, you could see that the thickness of the ring maintains the anterior capsule far away from the posterior capsule. And this is, I'm using the E-ring as an example, and all three devices are similar. So at left, you could see the arrows denoting the equator ring. <coughs> In the center is a Sinsky-style optic of the IOL. And as you can see here, the capsular bend is shifted to the equator. There is not much proliferative cortical material. And that the capsule is very expanded. And this, the visualization is enhanced via capsular staining. At right, the Sinsky IOL alone, you could see there's diffuse PCO and ACO. The capsular bag is contracted. And the bend is at the optic. So, in summary, for the CTR type devices, PCO and ACO prevention occur. All right. 
I'll put this, should I put it on hold? <laughs> okay. All right. I'll continue. So, in summary, these devices pre uh, prevent PCO and ACO by maintaining the circular contour of the capsular bag. The square edge shifts the capsular bent to the equator. Expansion of the bag, as we talked about with maintaining the anterior and posterior capsules maximally separated increasing the flow of aqueous humor, and ACO is prevented by maintaining the anterior capsule away from the optic. Now on to the IOLs themselves, and I'm going to start with the disc-shaped lenses. Concept 360 is a disc-shaped hydrophilic acrylic IOL, and it features six haptic components angulated 10 degrees posteriorly. And there are three goals in its design. Uh, maintenance of separation between the optic and the anterior capsule. And as you can see here, high frequency ultrasound in the human eye shows that the anterior capsule is far away from the optic. In addition, the Miyake Apple view, uh, this is a posterior view, show, it does a good job of illustrating its CTR effect. You could see that the device practically fills the entire capsular bag. And in addition, by exerting circumferential distension forces throughout the equator, it minimizes formation of posterior capsular striae and posterior capsular wrinkles, which can represent an additional pathway for LEC migration. And finally, PCO prevention. Next lens is the Zephyr IOL. It's also a disc-shaped hydrophilic acrylic. And at right, at the top left, you could see in high-frequency ultrasound in the rabbit, that the, the optic is vaulted posteriorly, and this allows maximal separation between the optic and the anterior capsule. In addition, it incorporates perforations into the haptic apparatus, enhancing the flow of aqueous humor throughout the bag. And in the rabbit studies, you can compare the Zephyr to an aqueous soft control lens and you could see the relative capsular transparency in the rabbit model. Very interesting in this study, in the rabbit study, was that even when the IOL was accidentally inserted upside down, due to its CTR-like effect because of its disc shape, it maintained, uh, it, this did not affect PCO, illustrating that tight contact between the optic and the posterior capsule is not necessary in PCO prevention and that other factors must be at play here. So the perforations enhanced aqueous humor flow. The CTR effect was very important. Um, it expands the bag and ACO prevention via the same mechanism I've been mentioning previously. Now on to the dual optic lenses. And I'll start with Harrah's spring-loaded IOL. And this is a precursor I'll talk about next. So this lens features two six millimeter um, PMMA optics and four obliquely oriented polyvinylene fluoride rings. And these rings have a spring-like effect, allowing for, through torsional compression, the device can be inserted through a small uh, incision in the eye. However, once inside the capsular bag, it opens up very quickly and applies pressure to the sidewalls at the optic. And Harrod et al. postulated that by this pressure on the lens epithelial cells prevented LEC metaplasia, and they termed this mechanical compression inhibition. And, it, and this lens was successful in uh, preventing PCO and ACO at areas of contact. Now, the synchrony IOL is an interesting lens. It's a dual optic accommodative lens, and as we mentioned with Dr. Werner's study, silicone plate haptic IOLs were associated with the greatest amount of ACO. And especially since this lens relies on the anterior 
displacement of the anterior optic relative to the posterior optic to get this accommodated. Uh, it's very important to incorporate the UCL prevention mechanism into its design. And as you could see on the lower right, these red arrows denote these expansions emanating from the anterior, cap anterior optic surface that serve to lift the capsule erectus edge up and prevent contact between the two structures. And here histopathologically, you could see that the bag is very expanded. The anterior capsule is far away from the posterior capsule. And with the synchrony, there's just limited soma and ring formation at the equator. Contrast this with the traditional plate haptic silicone IRLs in which there is diffuse ACO and PCO. So by lifting the restless edge away and expanding the bag, the synchrony uh, prevented postoperative capsular repacification. And now onto the silicone oil filled fluid vision IRL. And this lens is very different. It features these gigantic haptic components that practically fill the capsular bag and maintain the anterior capsule and the posterior capsule at a great distance from one another. Um, now these haptics are deformable and filled with refractive index mass silicone oil. And in efforts of accommodation, deformation of the haptics drives the fluid from the haptic components into the hollow hydrophobic acrylic optic chamber and making it a rounder shape and this really simulates uh, natural accommodation. Now in the rabbit studies and I want to point out that this is six months and for those of you who've worked with rabbits as a model for PCO and ACO you'll know that six months in the rabbit is equivalent to years in the human eye and to have this little proliferation and this kind of transparency at six months is truly incredible and contrast this with the uh, control IOL, which is uh, plainly visible right there. And now I'd like to discuss our current project, which is a protective membrane. It's made of silicone, and this silicone membrane is introduced into the capsular bag, and an IOL is introduced into it. In addition, the membrane features a pattern on its posterior surface, and this pattern as an in vitro study has been shown to decrease cellular adhesion. And due to the bulky nature of the device, you could see here that the capsular bag is very expanded. Uh, so far, we've had success in PCO prevention. And with the protective membrane at left, you could see that it's relatively transparent uh, and contrast that to the control with the uh, IOL alone. And this is, uh, has been submitted for presentation at the ASCIS meeting, and we're submitting it to JSCRS, and it's an ongoing project. So the take-home message I want you to leave here with is that there are 10 devices and IOLs that have successfully prevented both PCO and ACO through expanding the capsular bag, and one last time, maintaining the anterior capsule and posterior capsule separated. secondary to expansion, um, and that the shrink wrap effect traditionally postulated is not the full story with regard to IOL-related PCO prevention. Thank you very much, and uh, this is from my first fly fishing lesson. I caught my mouth in a park at Long Pier and surrounded by grizzly bears, and I hate questions, but got my heart pumping. Thank you very much. Sorry about the no problem. You did a good job there. Thanks. Kyle, Kyle
Kyle McLean is going to now present to us about multi-component lens technology. Okay. Uh, good morning. And thanks, Greg. Yeah, that was quite the feat you pulled off with the flashing lights and the noises. Um, hopefully, we won't have anything like that again. But my name is Kyle McLean. I am also an Oculus Pathology and Research Fellow this year uh, in the Mammal Corner Lab. And uh, just for clarification, I have no financial interest um, in any of the materials you mentioned this morning. And uh, I'm excited to talk about a project that we've been working on and that we're now in the process of mission for um, involving a multi-component IOL system. And so I just want to talk a little bit about um, this technology, which is, is a fairly new thing. Um, and as an overview of kind of what I'm going to discuss, uh, first we'll just kind of give a really brief uh, introduction to what the need might be or why is this technology being developed for adjustable IOLs in general, not just multi-component, but we'll look at a variety of different ideas that are out there far as making an IOL that can, can change. Um, and then the focus, though, will be on, on multi-component IOLs or multi-component IOL systems. And there's two in particular that are, are now um, advancing more in the trials, uh, one in Europe and one in the United States. And this last one here is the one that uh, we've had a chance to work with in particular. And we'll talk about maybe what are the benefits or what, is, what does the future hold for this kind of technology. And so, you know, why, why would there be a demand or a need or an interest in an adjustable IOL is the question. And um, there's probably many reasons. Um, these are just a few maybe ideas. Uh, the first being, though most surgery is, is very successful, and you can see there's a large percentage of cataract surgeries that get a very good um, outcome as far as refraction or, or need for refraction. Um, there still is a decent percentage of people that might not be satisfied. Um, and you can see that according to the surveys Dr. Mamos has on his clients with IOLs, it's still a very common reason for an explantation and exchange, and that is an incorrect lens power. And so it depends on the material, but I just pulled an example here. For example, on a three-piece hy hydrophobic acrylic lens, it was the most common reason um, in the last published survey. And so it is, it is an issue, and something that certainly um, can lead to better patient outcomes. Uh, another interesting area that uh, is being recently discussed, and I'm sure has some controversy, is in pediatric surgery and the possible benefit uh, in children who have cataracts and need cataract surgery. And then the last area that I'll just touch on very briefly is uh, possibilities of multifocals or torus IOLs. And so what are some of the ideas that are floating around? And these, these are not, this is not an all-inclusive list, certainly, and um, I am not an expert on most of these, or probably any of these, you could say. Um, but just to kind of give you an idea, there's um, been the, the published the idea of a mechanically adjustable IOL. And so one where you can go in and physically rotate um, a knob or something that will help change the lens power ever so slightly. Um, similarly, there's one that's magnetically controlled. And again, these are very, very experimental. These are not things that are going through trials or going to be on the market anytime soon. Um, this one I just thought was really interesting. Uh, the idea that you can make an IOL with liquid crystal inside and that wirelessly you can change the makeup uh, of what's inside the IOL to change the lens power, I thought was very outside the box and very interesting. But again, very, very, very experimental. Uh, this fourth one here is um, further along. This is actually a lens that is going through trials and one that we've seen in our lab this last year, um, and that is the light adjustable lens. There's one from Calvin Vision uh, that I believe was presented just about a year ago by a fellow. Um, in his talk, but this uh, is a lens that using a special apparatus and light, you can adjust the power of the lens. And then our last one here is what I'll be uh, discussing and what our project revolves around, that is a uh, lens with multiple components uh, that can be changed um, to change uh, lens power, um, for example. And so the first one I'll talk about is the Eisite IOL well, again. This is from Infinite Vision Optics, which is a company based out of France. And this is an IOL that currently is in trials in uh, Europe and looking for approval in Europe. And 
it, it's, an, it's a simple concept, a two-piece concept. And so here you see there's a base plate <coughs> or the base part of the IOL that two or four haptics, however you look at it, is holding the bag open. And then on top, they've placed this optic piece with two little wings. And so these wings slip under these bridges that they've built into the base. Um, and what's interesting about their design is that that uh, second piece or the optic sits on top of the anterior capsule. And so that is not within the bag, if you will. Uh, it is a hydrophilic acrylic design, again, a two-piece uh, two system. And again, it's a little unique in that you have one piece sitting completely in the bag and that op optic which sits outside. Um, and those wings are sitting on top of the anterior capsule. And they've actually done this in humans in six patients, six eyes. Uh, they've implanted this lens. And they did a two-year follow-up, which came out recently, uh, last year. And it's still early, you know, it's just a two-year follow-up, but so far they were very encouraged with what they've seen. Uh, no PCO was observed in any of the eyes. The, uh, the, the base of the eye will seem very stable, uh, and there's no internal tissue fibrosis or opacification. Uh, and the patients in general were very satisfied with the outcomes, and there actually wasn't any need to consider any exchange uh, or what they call enhancement of surgery of changing out the optic. And so, so far it looks like, according to them, things have gone very well with this, with this lens. And so now I'll come to the Harmony Modular Eye Level System. And again, this is um, by ClearVista. This is a lens being developed in the United States and uh, is looking for approval in the United States. Um, and it's a little bit different in its material, hydrophobic acrylic versus the hydrophilic acrylic lens. Again, though, it does have a similar two-piece design where you have a base that sits within the bag, but this time the optic as well will sit inside the bag within the base. We'll take a look at that a little bit closer to give you an idea of how that works. So this is just a video of how uh, the lens will be implanted. And so if you should do this through a clear corneal incision. There's an injector. Uh, just like a standard eye well, you'll inject it into the bag with this foldable material. And in our experience, it unfolds pretty nicely. Uh, maybe not quite as nicely as that video. Pretty close. And then again, a second injector with the optic piece uh, is placed, again, within the bag. And then with a little bit of manipulation, you can slide the first wing into that base piece. And then using this little manipulator hole, you can slide the second one in as well. And so ideally, with two small manipulations, two small maneuvers, you could have the optic uh, securely in place. And again, that hole allows you then, if you want to come back, to just slip that end out, pull this other end forward, and then take the optic out while leaving the base uh, in the bag, in the bag. Right, exactly. Yeah, and we haven't done that. There's one report of a presser site, the European done one exchange and it was outside of that study so it was a commentary that they sent in but they said it went well in the exchange in the lab so that's all we have to go off of right now but um, so I'll introduce our study this is a rabbit study uh, with six rabbits and the design was to put the test lens the IOL system in the right eye and then a control lens which is just a transfer available single piece hydrophobic acrylic in the left eye and we followed these rabbits for six weeks doing slit lit lamp exams throughout that time um, followed by um, manipulation and further examination through Miyake uh, Apple View and histopathology. And uh, we found lots of interesting results, so much so that this will be something that uh, we're going to submission uh, and something that we'll be able to present uh, later on at ASTRA. But to get to the results, this was at two weeks. And you can see um, in this short time frame, not a lot is, is different. Um, this is our control here on your right. And it looks nice and clear. And on the left here is a test piece. You can see it's nicely in the bag. We have the nice manipulator hole here. It's kind of going to orient us to make sure that this is stable and, and keeping its place in the bag. By week four, um, and again, as, as Greg mentioned, the rabbit model is very, a very accelerated model of PCO. And so by four weeks, in a control lens like this, we would expect to start to see some, some opacification uh, of the capsule. 
and that's illustrated very nicely here. And traditionally, it'll start at the optic haptic junction, as you see. There's the haptic here coming down. And it's budding out and starting to fill into the center. And the same thing is kind of happening over here. It's a little bit shadowed. Uh, however, if you look over on, the, on your left, the test lens looks very good um, at this point, focused on the posterior capsule. And again, that manipulator hole is right down where we left it. And so it's holding a uh, good position. It's very stable within the bag at this point. And by week six, you can see um, we have quite a, quite a mess of opacification in our control lens, covering the entire thing. Whereas in our test lens, it's pretty clear, a few giant pills here and there. <laughs> Other than that, though, it's very clear. And again, the manipulator hole is in the same little spot where we left it, um, showing some good stability. And so I want to flip 180 degrees now. And so after the rabbits were sacrificed and, and the quills were prepared, we got a nice Miyake, Miyake apple view. And if we again look at our control over here, standard IOL, we can see the entire posterior surface of that capsule uh, is, is opacified and covered with material uh, in contrast to our control lens here. And luckily, I'm coming, I'm, I'm presenting after Greg, who presented kind of some of the theories and the reasons that, that, that we might see the reduction in, in PCO. And what we feel is, is in play with this particular device is this nice, long, square haptic here covering this entire side and, and creating that contact inhibition uh, with the capsule of the bag, preventing uh, migration of uh, the lens uh, epithelial cells. And so that's kind of what we feel is working here uh, in this device. And so just to confirm that with some histopathology, again, this is our test device. I'm going to outline the bag here for you. Uh, very clean on both the anterior and posterior surfaces. No submarines or anything. Uh, in general, it looks like a very good very nice eye. In contrast to our control, which only after six weeks, again, not a particularly uh, long study like the six-month study we saw before, but already you can see significant uh, material forming on the posterior capsule and anterior capsule, as well as two very nice, large submarines rings. And so, um, you know, we were very, we thought the results were very, very interesting and had some, some interesting future implications which I'll discuss just briefly. And one of those is, is for use in pediatric surgery, as I mentioned before. Uh, and I know this is, you know this is a topic that will be uh, debated, discussed, but um, there's actually a nice little commentary paper by Dr. Portalio, who was working with the Presicite lens, the European lens uh, uh, out of Greece. And uh, he presents some interesting ideas. One is, is pretty understandable given the design of the lens, and that is that there might be an easier time adjusting or a changing out the optic. Uh, particularly in our children and child in a child whose uh, refractive needs will change over time as they grow and as the eye develops. Um, also, children are a big problem with PCO and inevitability. And again, encouraging the rabbit, rabbit model is that this lens uh, seems to at least slow the progression of that from occurring. And then she presents some other ideas I thought I would just mention briefly, um, particularly in very young children where there's a lot of debate as far as whether an IOL should even ever be considered, uh, whether a child should be left aphakic and should be given contacts. And then that opens a discussion about well, what is compliance and trying to reduce contacts in a child. And so she presents maybe this will give um, surgeons more confidence in considering a lens uh, like a multi-component lens that is adjustable uh, that might slow PCO and, and some of the other positives that we've seen. Uh, another point that she brings up also is that in, if the ag laser treatment were to be used, and this is not just for a child um, or a, a posterior capsular rexus is made, because that base piece stays in place, it might make future surgeries safer because you can just remove the optic, leaving a nice space in the bag, preventing ventricular fluid leaks, for example, and providing a more stable uh, surgery in the future after such treatment. And so some interesting ideas, certainly, and interesting concepts to consider um, the benefit this might provide in the pediatric population. Uh, and then, of course, in adults, some of the same things um, are of, of great benefit. Uh, as we saw, it's not going to be 100% as far as reaching the ideal lens power, refractive outcome. And there are a number of ways you can approach how to treat a patient afterwards, whether it's corneal surgery or adjustment of the lens. But this might make uh, lens adjustment easier, um, particularly in patients who maybe don't have other options. And then, of course, PCO is still an issue, particularly in patients on the younger side of the adult cataract uh, population. And then the last little point is uh, multifocal IOLs. Um, and 
you, you probably can see along the same lines as, as what's mentioned for lens power. This might provide an opportunity for a patient to try to see if they will adapt well to the multi multifocal or to use the multifocal, and then if they later were to develop something like a macular degeneration, it might provide an easier exchange to a different lens or a monofocal lens um, from the multifocal lens. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting project, and I think it's an interesting technology, and there's still a lot to discover. Um, again, we, in our project, haven't taken out lenses or been exchanging back and forth, and so that's certainly an area that will be um, further explored. Uh, and I think another interesting thing to think about is, you know, the base is made to stay in permanently. If it does have to come out, how will that work? How easy will that be? I think there's another interesting question that could be explored. Uh, but I'd just like to thank uh, my mentors, my co-fellows who also worked very hard on this project and others. And I'll take any questions or comments at this time. Now we'll be hearing from Abba Tarifi, who will be speaking about 